Welcome to episode 24 of Created by Design. I have several things I want to show you today. Um, some of my new challenges and uh, uh, it's new to me. Hopefully it'll be something maybe new to you too. First of all, I want to show you that I finished another one of our little animal friend characters uh, by Lois Crowweather. And this one I actually had to make up my own head pattern. This was made by special request. Um, uh, nephew's wife wanted a little llama for her granddaughter. And I don't have a llama head pattern. So I think if you think llama, <laughs> you can kind of say, oh, that's a llama. But her name is Joy. I had fun making her and she will soon go down to California. But she's all done, got her shoes all done. Long legs here, a little shoes. Got buttons on everything, got her little French knickers made with a little tail back here. You always have to leave a little opening for those tails to go through. And made her a little purse. So this is Joy. And uh, I have to really admire the developer of these little animals because these heads, it's all about the heads. The bodies all look the same, but the heads are what give the personality and depict which animal it is. Uh, she has just come out with a new book that's going to be released in May. Uh, of course, I pre-ordered one and it will have lions and tigers. Uh, some little uh, chimpanzee, hippopotamus. I can't wait to see the hippopotamus. Um, zebra. So that will be fun to get that book and get some uh, wild animals. So uh, you know I'll have to make a couple of those. But anyhow, I just wanted to show you. I finished this project and she's going to go and hopefully give a little girl a lot of fun time. Now the next thing I want to share with you is I'm really excited and kind of terrified about it at the same time. Uh, it, I'll show you the book. And it is called Bohas Stickning. I'm sure I'm not saying that correctly. That is a scan Swedish name. Um, and I had never heard of this style of knitting before. Um, even though my ancestry um, really comes from Sweden, um, I got to go to Sweden. I've actually been there a couple times now uh, and had never seen or heard about this. So it was, it was really exciting to me um, when I found out about it. And I actually found out about it from another um, group I follow called Fruity Knitting. And it was in their episode 113. And they had um, on there this gal talking about the revival of this style of knitting. And I will say, I, I just know that it's going to be one of the more challenging or most challenging uh, thing I've probably ever done in knitting. It is, I'll get a quick little picture here, um, and I'm gonna send you to a place on YouTube that you can uh, see up close and personal. But I just wanna pick up one of these really incredible designs. Uh, hopefully you can kind of see that. Um, and at first glance, it looks like Fair Isle. And you would think, oh, what's the big deal? You've been doing Fair Isle. Well, yes, there are some similarities, but there are some really big differences. Fair Isle is using only two colors at a time in one row. And uh, typically it never has a purl stitch used. It's all knit stitch, uh, which gives a, a completely different look. I love color work, strand work and um, I love Fair Isle. But this looked so intriguing. I thought I'm gonna see if, I, and hopefully I can actually do it. It will not be fast knitting because some rows have up to five colors that you're carrying across per row. Now there's only a few of those in the overall pattern, but nevertheless, that's a lot of colors to manage. And um, 
The other thing that it does is it uses purl stitches um, along with knit stitches. And so if you're a knitter and you know that when if you've used two colors before and you put a purl stitch on top of a knit stitch or in the next row above it or below it, uh, you get you see other colors. You'll see the color below in the stitch and the one you're working with. So now all of a sudden, your two colors that you were working with now, you get a different blend. And so it's very different to the eye and far more um, challenging to read a, a grid pattern. And I'll show you one of the grids that they give in here. Um, I should have had that page marked, but I didn't. Um, let me show you this one right here. I'm not making this one, but that is not just color change, but it's also stitch changes within a given color. So uh, I can just I know already that's going to be very challenging, but I'm so intrigued with it. And um, my grandma came from Sweden when she was about four years old in, um, I even wrote it down here so I wouldn't forget, it was 18, I believe 1892 maybe. Um, but she's the one that taught me how to knit. And I was probably at about the age six. Um, when I first took my knit stitch someplace in there. And of course, you know, when I was a child, it was very simple knitting, but that means I've knitted over 70 years. So that sounds rather <laughs> frightening. Uh, but she, I never heard her talking about um, this bow stickening method. And it comes from a very specific place in Sweden. And what I really love about the story is, um, and, and we've heard this about other parts of the world, how knitting became such an intricate part of a family's uh, livelihood and how um, uh, the industry uh, saved towns, saved actually even saved countries. And, you know, the raising of sheep and producing wool used to be a very, very large industry here in the United States. It was a big part of their our whole um, monetary system, uh, the textile industry. Well, we now, uh, there's only just a couple of places in the United States that even process wool in big quantities. Oh. You know, there was a whole industry of workers lost their jobs when the, the you know, textile industry began to shut down in the United States, which also included cotton, not just lamb's wool. But here we are back in Sweden uh, in the, uh, I, I wrote notes, I'm going to put my glasses on because I am going to give us just a tiny, tiny bit. Of, of history. And um, as early as 1914, uh, Sweden began to be affected uh, through uh, World War I, which came along a little bit later. Uh, but right at about 1914 is when World War I had a great effect, shut down some industry to, in Sweden, stone. Um, masonry was brought almost to an end, not 100%, but um, in one little area of Sweden where this Bohas um, came from, uh, that part of Sweden just, there was like over 5,000 households that all of a sudden didn't have an income and uh, no way to get an income because trade was shut down and um, so they were they were in trouble they were, didn't have food to put on the table and move forward a little bit in 1929 the uh, Wall Street crashed here in the states when 
all of the downturn, you don't think about how Wall Street affected other parts of the country, but it greatly affected parts of Sweden and in this Bohas area particularly to the point that the big industry um, owner uh, took his own life because he had lost everything. And so it was really, really hard times. And um, along comes a lady named Emma. And I'm going to try to say Emma's last name. And I'm going to actually post some links. If you're curious about history, you can go on and read in more detail yourself. But Emma was born in 1883. She was uh, born to a Jewish family that was had some pretty good connections um, to some very well-known people. And even back then, of course, it was not customary for girls, even in influential homes, to get educated, but she wanted to get educated. And uh, so her father uh, allowed her to go to college. She wanted to be an artist, and that was not acceptable. So they allowed her to become a botanist. So that's what she got her degree in, which was back then highly, highly unusual. I'm going to connect all these pieces here in a few minutes. But just thinking about the fact this little Jewish gal in 1883 comes into this world and she's going to have a major, and that was in, um, I think, Vienna is where she was born. And move forward to 1912. She meets a man, marries, and they move to Gothenburg. And I'm not quite sure what took them there. I just have not devoured that much of the history. But in 1912, she gets married, moves to Sweden. In 1934, she, uh, or her husband, gets elected as the county governor. And uh, so she is a wife to a very important person in that part of Sweden. Now, this is in the um, more where the islands are in the lower part of Sweden. And uh, my family came up from more of the central part, um, Smuland. So I'm not familiar with this particular area of Sweden, uh, but it's where all the rock or a lot of rock quarries were. And um, so now her husband is elected and the country is still struggling because uh, Wall Street has crashed a few years prior and people are out of work uh, during this time that she's getting, uh, has become married and the area is just depressed. And not only that, but um, there just wasn't a lot of opportunity for industry to grow anywhere at that point in time. But a group of ladies that knew this area, that came from this area of, of Bohas, uh, actually came to Emma, the wife, and said, is there anything you can do to help us uh, with small home industry? We have these wives, these women, that have nothing to do. They're, they're starving, they're trying to feed their families. So this Emma, quite a creative lady. She was not being a botanist. She actually, now that she was a wife, could go back and dabble in her interest of arts. And she must have been quite a, quite a smart lady. Um, in researching, she discovered that, you know, they had some sheep's wool and a cottage industry of knitting uh, to make small items would put the, help put the ladies to work. So try to fast forward out of that little step. A whole industry, Emma, put it together. She never got paid. She totally volunteered her time. This went on for years of her uh, training people how and, she, and Emma developed, along with some other ladies, but she was the main person, developed this way of knitting, this boha stickning. And I have to say, it's quite complicated. And she wrote out the patterns. There were a few other people along the way that wrote out patterns, not the, how we have them today, but they were basically laid out on a big piece of paper 
and there would be some writing but there was a lot of drawing and design that way totally different than how we would knit today but she started a school and she brought in specific ladies to learn to knit and they became uh, just really expert this took several years um, in this way of knitting and of course it developed over time but then these ladies went back into their neighborhood and they would then train other housewives to knit and how to do it this specific way and so the Bojas um, headquarters where Emma was they would send out the yarn specifically for a sweater with certain lengths cut so this is what you have to work with this is the sweater you're going to make and um, it became quite an industry and because Emma was well known in important places around the world because of her family influence she was able to get these sweaters in places I never shopped they came to the United States uh, worn mostly by the elite um, I figured that those sweaters back then could have well been close to what would now be considered a thousand dollars I'm just trying to put pieces together to figure that out but it seems like that's about what it would be and um, made quite an industry for Sweden for a number of years and I actually was shocked to find that they eventually closed down in the 1960s those sweaters were still out all over the world I don't think JC Penney carried them <laughs> For those of you that are watching that are in the United States, you know J.C. Penney's. Uh, certainly wasn't at any stores that I was shopping at. But she uh, remained uh, just the head of this industry, but she totally volunteered her time. What a brilliant woman. And they credit her now. There's a big museum. Much is being written about her and this Boha Stickning and the effect that it had on all of Sweden. And what really closed down the industry, and this is really kind of sad, uh, used to be tourism, especially back to the United States, we could bring in, like if you were visiting Sweden, you could bring in like up to $500 worth of um, product or things that you bought without having to pay any taxes or anything on it. Well, that was changed to a hundred dollars. Well, that really shut down the, the sweaters being bought because even back, like I say, back in the day, they were very, very expensive sweaters, not something that the average person would wear. There's several old movies out. Eartha Kitt is one um, wearing uh, one of these sweaters and there's other movies uh, back a number of years ago where these sweaters were very popular. That's probably why I never heard about them because we just didn't shop in those places. But I was so surprised to hear the history and there's so much more detail. Uh, I just gave you just a, a brief and probably didn't even do it justice. But this Emma was quite creative and she not only controlled and ran the company itself but she in the beginning hand sorted the the wool and there actually was a sheep that was almost in extinction in Sweden and it had some of the best wool for this kind of knitting and it saved that lamb that sheep from going into extinction. So now you not only had the women um, uh, knitting, but you had families raising the sheep. And what made their yarn so wonderful is it was Angora from rabbits. And so then that meant that there were farms that were raising thousands of rabbits for this yarn, because it's a very, very specific yarn in order to call your sweater a bo um, 
bow stiffening, it has to be made from this specific yarn. They'll tell you, you have a beautiful sweater, but it's not a true bow stiffening if it's not made with the blend of yarn that she also developed. And they hand dyed all of the yarn. So it really became a very big industry in Sweden, had a big impact on really impoverished areas. Well, it's been revived and um, it museum has been opened up now. Um, you can order online these sweater kits. You cannot just order up a pattern. I stepped up and bought this. By the time I got this book sent to me from Sweden and paid all the little upgrade taxes, etc., uh, this pattern book cost me $60. And I don't buy many books. <laughs> but this one with the history and the pictures, um, it just caught my eye. Here's another um, beautiful one. I can hold it up here better, can't I? And um, uh, hopefully you can, can get a glimpse of how beautiful the blending of the colors is. So it's the colors, the blending, the texture of the yarn, all of that makes uh, these beautiful, beautiful sweaters. Uh, so in this book, the reason why I went ahead and bought it is they do have several sweater patterns. And I think the one that I'm actually going to do, I think that might have been the one that I was just showing you. Um, I'm not going to make it in the blue tones. Yeah, it's called Blue Flower. I'm going to, I'll hold my yarns up here in a second. Um, I went online and priced this out. Um, of course, it's all priced in Kruger's, but I converted that over. By the time I would get that here, the kit would cost me real close, if not a little over $600. Well, that's not in my birthday budget. <laughs> and so uh, it, it's a very fine yarn. I'm sure it's fabulous yarn. I just was wanting to back up and say about the Angora rabbits. They cut with scissors. They cut the Angora off the rabbit. So the rabbit is, uh, they do it all by hand, held and cut. It's not an electric uh, shear. It is with scissors and they just treat that Angora yarn very, very carefully. And so it's blended with merino wool. And that is what makes their yarn so special and because it's all hand done. And um, I think they send it off to Denmark to get it uh, spun, but you can only get it through uh, buying direct from um, this, I can't even say the people's names in here, so I'm not even going to try. But I'm gonna post all the names of this on this video so you can see where I'm talking about. And um, there's a YouTube um, with Fruity Knitting and it's their episode 113 that you'll hear the, one of the gals talking about it and taking you into some of the places where this yarn is and it's just, it's incredible. I just found it so intriguing and the history of it and the effect that knitting had uh, on Sweden. And um, so I think that alone was just incredible. So then my journey was, well, if I don't buy that yarn, I probably won't make that sweater because it just has to have a really fine um, uh, yarn, nice twist. And I thought, well, I'll just keep my eyes open. You know, the internet, I don't know how, somehow through Facebook, one of those magical connections, one day, um, a little ad popped up. And it was about cashmere yarn, and it was 50% off. And when that stuff comes up on Facebook, I'm like, yeah, right. You know, I won't touch it because nowadays you know how you just can't, you can't trust anything. But... A few days later, I, I saw it again, 50% off. 
and um, so I thought, you know, I'm just, I'm just gonna, because usually I'm, I won't even click on anything like that, and I just thought, okay, I'm gonna be brave today, and maybe I'm gonna get myself into trouble, but I'm gonna snoop a little bit. So I, I got the name of the company and that was sponsoring this Facebook connection and totally look legit. They sold all kinds of things. Uh, it's an online store. They have furniture. They have clothing. They had cashmere. They had cashmere yarn. And they had this yarn. And I thought, well, I'm going to look into it because I knew cashmere was wonderful and knew it was a fine yarn. And so um, up pops this farm, uh, I'll call it a farm, um, in Mongolia, where the cashmere goats are raised. And it, there was video on there. Um, and I just, I kept researching a little bit more. It was, is a, a German gentleman from Switzerland and cashmere used to be a big big uh, industry in uh, or much bigger at one time in Mongolia and then like so many things kind of died out wasn't the demand very expensive very expensive to process all of that story and um, along the way I found a video about this particular farm that this cashmere yarn is coming from and um, I'm going to post that here because it's so interesting. So it is a company that's actually gone into a village in Mongolia. Uh, they've built schools. Um, they give the people good rams to breed with, help them build up their breed and they're raising these cashmere goats. Uh, for this yarn and by doing all of this it is actually starting to bring the price down of the cashmere to make it more affordable and I really try to be quite careful about buying everything from China you know there's some of it we just can't get around but I, try, I watch it try to be careful and and uh, Mongolia is part of China uh, but um, you know, you never want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. And so I just kept coming back and doing a little more research, digging a little deeper, and everything seemed to be legit. And so I bit the bullet and I bought um, a variety of colors that I thought might blend into one of these Boha Stickening patterns. So I won't be able to say it's a boha stickening sweater because I'm not using the right yarn, which, you know, I, I get, I understand that. But I think this is probably a pretty good um, substitute for their yarns. And um, I've got a black in here also. And so these are the colors I'm going to work with. And let me tell you, it feels wonderful. And I knitted up a little swatch last night, so I have figured out my gauge and it comes out really, really close to the gauge that the pattern comes for. So I think I'm gonna be okay. But along with this cashmere, they recommend, and they send it to you, but it all comes together. This here is actually a man-made fiber, very fine we'll call it a nylon, and you put it with, you run the two strands together at the same time when you knit. And why this? Because it will stabilize the cashmere. Cashmere is very soft, very delicate, and uh, if you didn't use a stabilizer in it, you would take the risk of it just keeps stretching. That's like merino wool without uh, another wool blend with it or something along with it to help keep it from just sagging because it is so very soft. That's why we like it is because the feel is soft but that soft uh, has to be stabilized. Now if you were just making a shawl or a scarf um, you wouldn't need to use 
this stabilizer, and, and you can see this stabilizer probably doesn't even show up there, is just a real, real fine spun um, nylon. So that's what I'm going to work with. That's my project. This will be slow because uh, I can't, I'm going to make a card again. So I can't just knit in the round. Uh, if it was wool, I could. I could make a steak. But because this is so fine and soft, I don't think a steak would hold together very well. So the downside of not being able to knit in the round, when you're doing color work, on your knit side, your, your, outside, your, your face, the pattern, you see it when you're knitting. But then when you purl, you're turning it kind of inside out. You're, you're now looking at the back side and you cannot see your pattern uh, as easily it doesn't flow in the same way as you see it from the knit side so then everything that was a knit stitch is now a purl stitch so it will be slow going but because of the it, i have less by the way than half of what this sweater would cost in the angora the cashmere because they had this special offering of half price and i think the half price is still on um, it made it far, it's still an expensive sweater, but made it far more reasonable. And um, so that's my big challenge, and I'm going to be working on that for a while. We'll see how that goes. The challenge for me is going to be doing the color work from the pearl side. So every other row, you know, you're on the, either the knit side or the pearl side. That will be challenging. I have also tried, and I can do it, knitting uh, knitting backwards while the knit side is facing you. So then just start knitting from the left to the right. But that's kind of slow going too. And um, so I'm just going to do the sweater the way the pattern calls for, knitting and purling. I'm going to take my time. Uh, it will be challenging, but we'll see what happens, and I'll I'll keep you informed. Um, so that's where we are, and I hope maybe you've learned something new today. Uh, maybe you know all about boha stickening. Uh, I would love to see your comments if you have had experience with it, and hopefully it's going to be a successful journey. Uh, but I, I love a challenge, so I'm, I'm going to put my best effort into it. So that's what I'm up to. I hope you're finding good things to be creative with, and I so appreciate uh, all of our new people that have started watching and subscribers. And, <clears throat> and always feel free to hit like if you like it, and um, love to hear the comments. Thank you so much. And we'll be back in a few weeks. I'll keep you posted. Bye now.